Oh, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hey, so uh, good morning to everyone um, and good afternoon for anyone outside the Pacific time zone. Um, I'm Dr. Noel Schultz and I'm one of the co-directors of the Advanced Grid Institute and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our um, AGI ESIC uh, webinar and my colleague, uh, co-director colleague is uh, is Jeff Daigle from PNNL and l and, and he's here. So um, what we wanted to do was just start off with for a minute um, to provide a little context about AGI and about uh, ESIC. Um, so AGI is a research collaboration between PNNL and WSU. And here we have a little bit about our mission and vision um, as we're working um, for a simulation platform nationwide and data framework for advanced credit controls and operations. And we're also uh, looking at, at how do we enhance workforce, how do we promote our reputation, as well as enable a resilient North American grid. And um, this is the first of three webinars this semester um, that are AGI and ESIC. And our second one will be April 6th on transactive systems for shared energy economy with speakers from PNNL, WSU, Navista. And then our next one is uh, on April 27th will be on network microgrids as decarbonization and resiliency resources. So um, that's uh, the, our webinar is coming up. Um, ESIC um, has actually a, a weekly webinar and um, a little bit about ESIC. It's an energy center focused on education, outreach and research uh, from WSU and looking um, to transition to affordable, sustainable and resilient power systems as well as collaborations in education. And uh, we have weekly webinars. This is one of weekly that ESIC does. We also have uh, PCIRC webinars and then um, there's more information here as well as the website for ESIC. So that's a little bit of an introduction. Next, I wanted to uh, introduce our speakers today. We have a tag team uh, to talk about nuclear and um, we will have two presentations. And so, um, but one will be on a, a sister institute, the Nuclear Science and Technology Institute by Dr. Jim Bonsella, who is a WSU, who is director of that institute and also has a PNNL joint appointment. Um, and then we will have the second talk will be on uh, from Dr. Michael Haygood, um, who is an advisor to the Office of Research at WSU on small modular and advanced research reactor research development and demonstrations and how it relates to the grid. So um, before we get started, um, I'm going to encourage everyone. We're going to do Q&A after both presentations. Mm -hmm. So if you are um, if you are um, have a question, if you can put it in the chat and then Dr. Bonsella can maybe answer the first questions uh, during the second talk and then we will open it up to Q&A at the end. So um, that's uh, uh, our plan moving forward. So uh, next, I want to introduce our first speaker. And um, our first speaker is Dr. James Bonsella, who received a BA in chemistry from the College of Worcester, Worcester, Ohio. I think I said that right. Um, and his PhD in organic chemistry from University of California, Berkeley, working under the mentorship of Dick Anderson. After a two-year postdoc fellowship at Oxford University, he joined the Department of Chemistry at the University of Florida, and he's developed research programs in or, uh, organometallic chemistry and metal catalyzed polymer polymerization reactions and was promoted to the ranks of full professor in 2000. He moved from Florida to Los Alamos National Lab in 2003, where he continued his work in the chemistry area as well as fuel cells and catalysis, chemical origins of life and national security applications. Um, he was elected to as a fellow of the American Chemical Society in 2017 and a Los Alamos fellow in 2018. He joined WSU uh, in, in August of 2019 as a professor in chemistry and director of the institute he's gonna talk about. And he was named a PNNL fellow in 2020. So, Dr. Bonsella, would you like to uh, give your presentation? Sure. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Noel. 
It's a, a pleasure to be here. And let me share my screen. And let's see what we got here. There we go. Can everybody see that? Yes. OK, good. Uh, the whole thing I'm getting. There we go. Um, yeah. So. This morning. I don't know why I did that. Uh, this morning I'm going to talk about a little bit about the uh, WSU PNNL Nuclear Science and Technology Institute. And as Noel said, this is a sister institute to uh, the Advanced Grid Institute, of course, which which uh, you are all familiar. And uh, our uh, charge is is looking at nuclear science and technology. And so I'm the director of this institute. I'm in the chemistry department here at WSU. Neil Henson is the deputy director. He's uh, a staff scientist in the national uh, security directorate at 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 PNNL. And so as we started off here this past year, we, we created a, a, a strategic plan and we developed this strategic plan through a, a collaborative process with PNNL, uh, various people from PNNL, sector leads, management uh, staff and, and WSU faculty participants. And really what we want to do is advance the knowledge and applications uh, in, of nuclear science and technology. And we want to do this by creating cr effective partnerships between WSU and uh, PNNL. And uh, we want to become, as no surprise, uh, we want to be recognized as an international leader in nuclear related research and education. And uh, the, the overall goal is, is to uh, solve the problems associated with ensuring safe, secure, and environmentally sustainable deployment of uh, nuclear technologies. And so we want to have a, a robust research portfolio that will build upon our the, the mm. joint technical strengths between WSU and 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 PNNL. And so we're we have developed a research agenda uh, to identify research priorities, and we want to address national needs in the nuclear sciences. Now, nuclear science, of course, is a very broad topic, and uh, one of the things that we have to do is is to focus on what what we are really good at. Um, there's you know it's such a broad field. There's an entire national lab de devoted to nuclear energy, Idaho National Lab, and there are obviously many many uh, nuclear engineering departments in universities all across the country and across the world. So we have to play in in a in a space where we where we we really have our strengths. And so what we want to do is, is create, uh, you know, really good pathways to develop the next generation of nuclear uh, workforce and by engaging graduate students and postdocs uh, for uh, to pursue our, our research agenda. And uh, we would like to become known as a national leader in nuclear re related research and, and, uh, and education. And we'd like to get ourselves to a point where we're, we're putting in input providing input into the development of national priorities for funding uh, and, and for uh, program opportunities. Um, we really benefit from enhanced collaboration between WSU faculty and, and, and PNNL staff, and we really are working on pathways to facilitate that collaboration and to eliminate barriers for that collaboration. Obviously, these, you know, our two institutions are very different. They're different cultures. They have different uh, goals and uh, have our have different overall purposes, but we can work. I think we can work together and we, we really need to figure out how do we achieve the goal of one plus one is greater than two so that the, the sum of the two interactions is greater uh, than, or the whole of the interaction is greater than the sum of the parts. And so here's an example of a successful collaboration. This is the only sort of hardcore technical slide that I have. And without going into details, um, what this 
this uh, this is a fundamental study that was funded by the iDream Engineering Engineer Front or Energy Frontier Research uh, Center, which is funded by the Department of Energy Basic Energy of Sciences Office, and it's looking at the material that's dissolved in Hanford waste tanks. And much of the material is actually aluminates or aluminum oxide that's dissolved. And over here on the left, this structure, without looking at the details, you can see there's a lot of void space. It's not a very dense structure. When that waste is treated to precipitate this material that's dissolved, they add sodium hydroxide and the structure becomes much more dense. There's a fundamental transformation in the properties of the metal, the aluminum, goes from being bonded to four things to being bonded to six things, the structure gets more dense. And this precipitate forms from the processing conditions, and this is what they need to do to remove the waste from the tank and to process the waste. However, what was not known before this study is that the structural change is really slow. And this structural change to make this precipitate determines the rate at which the stuff precipitates from solution and thus it determines the rate at which the material can be treated. And so if you use this fundamental information to figure out how to make that transformation go more quickly, then you can speed up the rate of treatment. And of course, that saves everyone an awful lot of money. If you, if you can in increase it by a factor of two, then it takes half the time effectively to treat the waste. And so instead of taking 30 years to get through the tank farm, maybe it only takes 15. That's 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 a huge a huge thing. This research couldn't have been done by one institution or one research group by itself. There's uh, wet chemistry, there's analytical chemistry, there's computational and uh, chemistry and 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 modeling that's been done here. X-ray scattering. Both institutions played a crucial role. Uh, the lead author on this paper was a graduate student when it started. He's now a PNNL staff member. So there's your, your training and your pipeline. Uh, Sue Clark and Aurora Clark. Sue is, is the lead on the, on the PI. She's a, a, a professor at WSU and the chief science and technology officer at, at uh, PNNL. Aurora Clark is a professor at WSU and is the associate director of the institution. Other other members here are, are, are on the paper are, are staff members at 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 PNNL, and this this is a, 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 a wonderful example of where where we want to go with the institute, and I think where all institutes want to go, where we we create a, a collaboration, we solve an important problem, and even if it's a fundamental problem, it it is going to support and uh, greatly facilitate the uh, mission of of the laboratories. So in 2020, as after I got started here and and e even through the the COVID uh, shutdown and and trials and tribulations that we've had, we've now initiated a monthly webinar uh, where we we talk about what's going on in the institute and and have a little technical talk. We have monthly meetings with uh, the PNNL sector leads, and if, for those of you who don't know, the PNNL sectors are the people that that work with uh, the funding agencies in uh, Washington, primarily DOE, but other other funders as well. And so this gives us a pulse on what the needs are in in our areas of of interest. Uh, we've hired two faculty in chemistry, Leanne Moreau and Jeff Bell couple of postdocs who are working with me. Um, we've increased the number of joint appointments and we continue uh, graduate student engagement. So here's a photographs of a, a number of the graduate students who are involved in the Institute. There are actually more now and some of whom, well, some of whom are not pictured here. And we have faculty and staff engagement in the, in the center here are joint appointees from PN, PNNL and also from uh, WSU. There are other joint appointees who are appointments that are in process, uh, Sam Bryan and Amanda Lines and uh, Neil Ivory. And so we have a lot of engagement in this in this uh, institute. And I think things are moving forward very nicely as we develop more collaborations. And as a result, there were actually 30 30 papers that were published uh, that acknowledged the Institute in one form or another uh, uh, in 2020. 
So what we really are doing, one of the things that we will always be doing is build on complementary infrastructure between the two institutions. So at WSU, we have a trigger reactor, the training reactor out at the Nuclear Science Center. It's out by the golf course. Uh, the laboratories associated with the reactor enable one-of-a-kind experiments to perform, be performed on a university campus. Uh, because we are in a reactor building, we can handle uh, nuclear materials that you can, simply cannot handle on campus uh, and in most, most places anywhere. And so we have the opportunity to do experiments that, that other people simply can't do. At PNNL, they have the Radiochemical Processing Laboratory, which is a Category 2 nuclear facility. What that means is they can handle significant quantities of spe special nuclear material. And when I say significant, I mean gram to kilogram quantities, which is something that is unique in the DOE complex because this facility is only de dedicated to research and development. And so that's a strength and, and a strength that we want to capitalize on. In the 3400 area at PNNL, there are unique energy neutron sources and radiation detectors that are used for nuclear forensics and other national security uh, applications. And so we're in the process of enhancing the WSU reactor capabilities. And so the, we've had a design uh, study for infrastructure improvement out there uh, to, to uh, renovate some of the laboratory space. And the instrumentation that is new out there over the recent years there are some uh, very sensitive calorimetry experiments. There's a uh, benchtop extended X-ray absorption fine structure spectrometer that's being installed. Uh, we have the unique ability to study radiological material. As I said, uh, we're in the process of, of uh, they're in the process of doing detector upgrades, and we have a Murdoch proposal in for a small angle X-ray scattering. Uh, instrument, which is uh, really Im important and will provide a unique capability for structural characterization of, of, of nuclear materials. And so uh, you know, as we develop and upgrade the, the capabilities, this is going to further promote and, and develop WSU research programs. And there are challenges along the way. And one of the things that we're working on, and, and I have to say I'm pretty happy with uh, the progress that we've made here recently is uh, to facilitate the ability for PNNL to use instrumentation at WSU without having to write a subcontract for each each program. So we have these lofty goals, but then there are these very very uh, everyday kind of uh, real life challenges that 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 pop up that we have to solve along the way, uh, and this is. You know, this this particular challenge is is getting two very different uh, bureaucracies to work together in a seamless fashion. And so and for areas of technical interaction, if we just kind of look in, in a broad, broad stroke here, uh, we sort of have national security. I've divided up into national security, nuclear materials and, and waste treatment. Um, so fundamental actinide chemistry for national security is something that that's going on and that kind of cross cuts everything. We are looking for signatures uh, for activities that people are maybe doing, uh, for nuclear activities that people are doing, uh, looking at novel separations, also isotope production, and this supports uh, interest in nuclear forensics. In other words, how do you uh, attribute uh, the origin of material that you might find somewhere? That's just one, one example. Um, and for in nuclear materials, there are research programs on fuel forms, uh, fundamentals of fuel and molten salt interactions. That's important for next generation reactors, uh, looking at glass and waste forms, and then material behavior under irradiation conditions. This uses the, the trigger reactor to uh, as a place where we can do neutron irradiations and see how that affects the properties of, of materials. And of course, this, for example, all this work supports uh, small modular small modular reactors and advanced reactors, and Mike Mike is going to talk about that uh, in a little bit here. And then waste treatment, we're looking at glass behavior, waste tank chemistry. I said a little bit about there uh, from the iDream program, and this of course is all focusing on process conditions, which of course is uh, all in will be in support of the stand-up of the, the Hanford plant to start treating 
uh, the waste that's there. And cross-cutting all of this, of course, is student and postdoc training. By having these kinds of research programs, we, we provide an opportunity, an educational opportunity that you can't get anywhere else, I think, uh, being exposed to uh, the problems and uh, associated with, with, with this kind of uh, technical area and also associated with uh, being exposed to work at a national laboratory. And that really gives one a, a view into the entire national laboratory system. So that's about what I wanted to talk about uh, this morning. And I will hand the uh, floor back over to Noel. All right. Okay. Thanks, Jim, Jim, for that overview. So our next speaker, um, Dr. Mike Haygood, is going to talk about small modular and advanced reactor research and development and demonstration uh, implications for the electrical grid and plant scale energy systems. And this is um, obviously uh, been a big, uh, big topic in the Tri-Cities area in particular because of some new opportunities in R&D in that area. Uh, Mike has worked through his career advancing research and innovation programs in the energy environment and water research fields, working primarily in the Northwest and overseas. Most recently retired from Battelle Energy Alliance, where he engaged in program development at Idaho National Labs associated with applied research in renewables, fossil and nuclear energy, hybrid energy systems, energy storage, and electric vehicles. He also led efforts at INL for developing Western regional energy in initiatives. Uh, building on that, he's currently working as a consultant with WSU Office of Research and WSU Tri-Cities in developing strategic partnerships and collaborations to enhance WSU's research and education missions. He is a registered geologist in the state of Washington, and uh, he relocated back to uh, with his wife, Denise, to Washington in 2019 and, and resides in Richland. So, Mike. Thank you very much, Noel, and, and uh, thanks, Jim, for the transition. Also, a hat off to Anurag Essek and also Monish, if he's on the line, had the opportunity to work with them uh, back at INL in the day. And Noel, I appreciate the, uh, the, the title of doctor, but I'm, I'm not a PhD, but uh, thank you anyway, appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> and greetings from Richland. Uh, listen, I wanted to just give the group a little bit of an overview of emergent activities in our own backyard that may play uh, with your interest in energy systems and power systems both at PNNL and WSU, but also as an integrated force. And so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what's happening. Um, keep in mind, I'm not an expert in nuclear energy or electrolysis, and not all of the information has been forthcoming yet relative to these projects that I'm going to discuss, but stay tuned. It's a very, very interesting story. So, um, in October of 2020, as part of the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, which is under the DOE Office of Nuclear Energy, two teams were awarded a multi-billion dollar demonstration projects uh, intended to stand up advanced uh, nuclear reactors of a couple types. And, and those are associated with the TerraPower Natrium Sodium Fast Reactor and also the XC100 Advanced Reactor. And uh, both of these projects are intended to be completed within the next seven years. And that's not just the reactor, it's also the production of, of high assay, uh, um, low uh, enhanced uranium fuel, uh, 235, for fuel production. Also qualified reactor equipment fabrication and other key components. And these two reactors uh, that were approved by DOE are to be co-funded and potentially sited in Eastern Washington State. And I'll get into that a, a little bit more. Um, but both of these are slated to be sited in um, Eastern Washington State at 
Energy Northwest site, just about 10 miles north of Richland. And why Energy Northwest? Uh, Energy Northwest is a utility here in Eastern Washington, Washington State, that actually operates the only uh, commercial nuclear operator in the no operations in the Northwest. And it also had previously licensed a couple sites for additional reactors that were never completed. And those, those, that licensing for the construction of those, uh, of those reactors no longer exist. However, at one time they actually did have them licensed. So there's some previous activity there that would be useful. Um, as I said, the, the reactors are sited adjacent to the Columbia Generating Station, which is a 1200 megawatt reactor. And as such, they have access to existing key infrastructure uh, and experience in licensed nuclear operators and other qualified workforce. Um, one other item that, that's interesting here, it, it, it's not throughout Washington, but here locally, the community accepts very much nuclear power. And with these projects, there's the potential for financial de-risking through supplying power to meet local demand. Uh, this is a picture of the Energy Northwest site. On the far left, you see the Columbia Generating Station. And um, at, in the upper portion, you see where the, the natrium reactor would potentially be sited. Now, just to emphasize, the, the natrium uh, reactor uh, and, and TerraPower are looking at a number of sites, one of which is here in eastern Washington. Uh, other sites uh, could be elsewhere, even in the northwest, but elsewhere. With the XC100, um, this would be something that uh, they're, they're studying currently, uh, and, and there's only one site that they're studying right now, and this is at the WNP1 site. Um, and you can see in the index map uh, where the location of, of the Energy Northwest complex is. Again, it's about 10 miles north of Richland. And if you look on the far right, that's the uh, Columbia River. So uh, relative to the, the natrium, so natrium sodium fast reactor demonstration, the team comprises TerraPower from Bellevue, uh, GE Hitachi, uh, Northwest Energy, Bechtel Pacific Core, and others. Those in bold are actually residing or have activities in Washington State. It's a 345 megawatt reactor employing molten sodium as fuel and as coolant. And what's important to note here is the output of temperature. And this is, becomes very important in the longer term for integration. So uh, for I couldn't find the specifics for this reactor, but for MSRs in general, the estimated output of heat is around 500 to 550 degrees C. What's very interesting about this particular demonstration is it includes a molten salt storage capability, uh, which adds again to some interesting concepts associated with, with uh, uh, balancing and uh, uh, plant, plant activities. It's very safe decoupling the reactor and electricity generation. Uh, as I mentioned before, the project also includes the establishment of HALU enrichment, and the site is underground and to be sited uh, potentially at uh, WNP4 site as previously stated. There is a, a cooperative agreement that we just signed on March 1st with, with DOE, uh, so this is, this is moving ahead. So let me, let me uh, let me go back. The cooperative agreement with DOE has not been established yet. Uh, it's anticipated that this would be concluded maybe in April. Sorry for the correction. So with X Energy, uh, the team uh, includes X Energy, but also again Energy Northwest and Grant PUD, which is in our backyard. It's a high temperature uh, pressurized helium gas cooled reactor. And there would be four modules at 80 me megawatts each, um, and, but using triso fuel, again, HALU. So this is again, just under 
uh, uranium-235, and again, delivers both electricity and heat, and at 565 degrees C steam. Um, and this would also be placed out at the, the uh, uh, Energy Northwest site, at WNP-1, and this actual agreement has been signed, uh, and again, they are focusing on that particular sign. Just very quickly, uh, this is a picture of one of the pellets, and there's about 220,000 of these that would be in the reactor. Um, and again, just to, to, to uh, emphasize that as part of the demonstration, it's not just about emplacement of the reactor, but also backing it up with um, manufacturing of, of the uh, fuel. So from an energy perspective, what are some of the advantages that pertain to energy systems? Uh, these advanced reactors give you more flexible operations and integration into large regional electricity systems, both as base load and load following. So it complements um, integration with re renewable energy resources such as wind, solar, and hydro. Uh, it's also because of the high temperature output, a very interesting uh, configuration for applying to plant operations for hydrogen production, uh, ammonia or other uh, industrial processes. And because of the novel configurations, it, it can enhance flexibility and has online refueling. So you don't have to shut down the systems to refuel with a light water like you would with a light water reactor. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the nuclear reactor and the energy island concept. Again, because you can separate the nuclear reactor from energy from an energy island, it does have an impact on uh, lessening the complexity of licensing and increases the safety as well, and decreases the costs associated with that. And with a modular setup, you can respond to increases in demand and also capitalization strategies. So this figure uh, is intended just to show you the concept of the nuclear island and energy island concept. This is for natrium. But again, um, if you look towards the middle of the figure where it says RX building, that's where the reactor is. It's, in, it's below ground. And that complex, along with the fuel, is separated from the energy storage tanks as well as the uh, electricity generation piece. And again, you can think of these uh, from a perspective, how would that impact your thinking relative to establishing plant operations, uh, industrial uses, etc. I'm not going to get into detail on this one, but I think it's just important to note that there is also, aside from uh, these, these other advanced reactor projects, um, there is also the new scale SMR power module uh, developed out of Corvallis, Oregon, and it's part of what they call the Carbon Free Power Project, um, which is run by Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems. And theoretically, that they would be, and this is a light water reactor, small modular reactor, um, designed or designed and licensed by NRC for uh, the INL site with. 12 modules at 50 megawatts each. However, uh, New Scale has actually upgraded their modules to 77 megawatts uh, per module, but they have not been licensed, but I think they intend to uh, submit that design for licensing in, in four pack and six pack modules. The first module is to be established by 2029. Output temperature is much less than advanced reactors at 300 degrees. Uh, and there is some thought about how to uh, use the heat um, at the INL site, and some plans are being put together associated with that, whether it's for hydrogen production or desalination or other purposes. So uh, something that's been a, been in development over the last several ten several years is looking at integrated nuclear energy systems for application, not just for electricity, but for heat. And uh, there's, there's quite a few programs within uh, both EERE and also the Office of Nuclear Energy to 
further assess uh, the technical challenges and opportunities associated with that, including the economics. And just to focus in a little bit further, many of you have probably seen this a number of times um, out of H2 at scale program and EERE, but just to emphasize a little bit more uh, how uh, power and heat can be used for uh, uh, production of hydrogen and, and in turn how hydrogen can be utilized uh, for other purposes. And this is again a trend in thinking throughout DOE and now industry on how they can uh, actually enhance economics by production and balancing of the grid by use of H2. So this is uh, a, a figure from, from a Richard Boardman talk from INL. Uh, what I'd like to have you focus your attention on. And so you have the, the timing from 2019 out to 2030 and looking at the developments for application of nuclear reactors uh, beyond just electricity. But you'll see that uh, if you go down to level four, um, there's there's efforts uh, in, in play relative to looking at low temperature electrolysis demonstrations associated with with uh, nuclear reactors right now, light water reactors, and then also an intent to look at high temperature uh, electrolysis associated with light water reactors. And moving along the timeline, uh, moving to larger capacity. And we'll, we'll give you some examples of that. Just in, in level four then, you'll see the new scale light water reactor, which we just uh, presented. And they have similar goals in mind in regards to how to use both heat and electricity. And then uh, we just talked about the advanced reactors, molten salt and high temperature gas reactors. And, uh, and, and then finally, down the road, including with DOD, they're starting to look at micro reactors and cartridge reactors. But ultimately, uh, heading in the direction of how can nuclear reactors in various forms be applied to production of hydrogen? And then, of course, how can that hydrogen be applied to other things as well? So just a few um, selected activities ongoing nationally. So uh, DOE is co-funding at least four light water reactor hydrogen projects with commercial reactor systems right now. Uh, Exelon Energy Harbor, Excel Energy in Arizona Public Service. And just if you look at the example on the right, give you kind of an idea of the scale of electrolysis they're looking at. Uh, so lot, uh, these are in the form of demonstrations and ongoing over the next two to three years. Uh, increasingly, advanced reactor technology developers are advertising both electricity and heat applications, but also storage potential. All of those play into the energy systems perspective. Uh, talked about low temperature electrolysis, but there's also efforts to look at high temperature electrolysis. And again, how does that integrate into the grid dynamics and plant dynamics? Uh, just to highlight, PNNL and INL are working on a couple of efforts currently associated with high temperature steam electrolysis, but also looking at economics. And some of this is uh, being done with the Holiday Brothers uh, in, in PNL. And, and just to highlight, DOD is, is also pursuing a few demonstrations. Uh, one for design, engineering design for a mobile two to five megawatt um, reactor and then a stationary one. One designed more for forward basing and another for more permanent bases as backup uh, in, in, in the case that there's an issue with losing power. And these, uh, although it's not stated up front, these also have the potential to be integrated systems as well. And in Washington State, uh, just a few things to highlight for your information. Uh, the governor signed a bill in 2020 that allows for actually the, the uh, manufacturing and selling of renewable hydrogen. And an example of that is Douglas PUD uh, is including in their business plan the ability to use hydropower with uh, low temperature electrolysis to produce hydrogen. And this is actually very interesting. And so uh, it's actually in play right now. And, and similarly, Tacoma Power 
is um, implementing a pilot rate designed to uh, use electricity for industrial production of e-fuels such as hydrogen or hydrogen rich compounds. And, uh, you know, another Washington activity is Bellevue's PACCAR, which produces a Kenworth truck, is uh, in the process of building a hydrogen fuel cell car vehicle for long haul trucking. And I think uh, with initial intent to deliver to Long Beach port in California. And, and then uh, um, for those, some of you are already aware of this, but PNNL and the PNNL WSU Bioproducts Institute is actually engaged with the Port of Seattle and other players in regards to uh, developing an analytical framework for sizing of hydrogen fueling stations. And lastly, the, the Tri-Cities community is also, uh, given, given all its, its assets, is exploring deploying H2 ecosystem initiatives. And uh, I know PNNL and WSU were engaged in that discussion. So, um, from a perspective of WSU and PNNL, um, they, they have a tremendous amount of deep capabilities in the components of energy systems here, including with MSR um, and hydrogen and grid. Um, but they also have the opportunity to gain synergy between uh, WSU and PNNL, such as what you find in the institutes. And of course, there are other players in the region, uh, whether they're down here with the utilities or industry, but also looking further abroad over to uh, other national laboratories, INL and with DOE. Since most of these activities we've been discussing are tied to uh, U.S. Department of Energy, the role of national labs, of course, is quite, quite important. And I think uh, from what I've seen, PNL already has some, some good engagements with the National uh, uh, Reactor Innovation Center and uh, also with the EERE and also with INL. Um, that could be a nice foundation for uh, enhancing opportunities here more locally. Uh, again, I think, you know, this is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity that you find vendors or technologists actually bringing an advanced reactor demonstration um, to the site. So, um, and, and just kind of highlight, I think this is kind of an important comment from uh, the APS manager when you're talking about uh, electrolyzers it says it's really one thing to do a one megawatt electrolyzer skid in the parking lot it's a whole other challenge if you're talking about something greater and i think you can imagine when you start thinking about uh, these types of th this type of integration and their complexity their interdependencies and their scaling issues in addition to to the component level challenges uh there's a lot of research and development opportunity here and and it's right in our backyard so to me it's it's a great opportunity and with that i'm gonna end and just to note a couple other things this week uh today uh there was an announcement of the establishment of a fellowship for a uh, uh endowment for a professorship down here in tri-cities to address energy systems that uh, came from Bob Ferguson. And, and the other item I wanted to highlight is later this week on the 25th, on the Hill, uh, the Senate Committee um, for Energy Resources is hosting a session on nuclear energy. And both the CEO for X Energy and for Terra Power will, will be presenting. And I'll end there. Great. Thanks, Mike. We appreciate and and Jim as well, both of your presentations. So, Mike, I'm going to start with your a couple questions um, and then we'll um, uh, two questions that we have for you and then I'll ask Jim a question. And then um, if you have questions, uh, you can feel free to either put them in the chat or after we do these couple questions, we will uh, Open, uh, open it up if people want to ask the question, uh, uh, they can unmute and do that. So 
Um, the first one is, Mike, what type of jobs do you see for both electrical engineers and computer sciences related to these advanced nuclear uh, reactors? What what kind of, um, how do you see, um, you know, obviously there's some other, other engineers also involved in some of this design and activities. Where do you see some of the opportunities for EEs and computer scientists? Yeah, so so I'll make an anecdotal response in, in in a discussion that we had with Energy Northwest. Uh, they they do employ actually a number of WSU graduates, and primarily from um, for power engineering and electrical engineering and computer. Uh, perspective, computer science perspective, and just just for from an operations perspective. And if you think about where all this may may head, there's going to be a requirement for greater sophistication in thinking about how you perform uh, not just baseload but load following scenarios, and then even with more complexity, how you start to integrate in some of these other ancillary activities associated with the hydrogen production, uh, which, which indeed feeds another set of things. So a greater amount of sophistication from the modeling perspective is going to be required, but also just, uh, you know, more um, capabilities, more sophistication in the engineering, on the engineering side as well. But they're going to need those types of folks. And, and the Energy Northwest request is just one example. You're muted, Noel. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so the second question for you, Mike, is um, do you, when nuclear power generation, uh, you know, can be safe, what, what is the process related to the steam? Is it safe, uh, free from contamination, and is it used for, uh, for the public use? So when you talk about that steam production, um, what kind of opportunities are there? Well, if, if you if you think about the the nuclear island versus energy island perspective, the the energy island is outside that quote unquote nuclear safety zone, and so it it would basically be available to all. Uh, and and again, um, without the associated costs that you typically and safety concerns that you have to typically address while you're on site of the nuclear reactor. So it's a it's a tremendous benefit. OK. And then one more question. Um, uh, Anurag asked, uh, what what are the technical issues related to siting and grid integration aspects for advanced uh, small nuclear reactors? Um, do you, you know, what kind of, you showed some of those sites, um, as we look at different generation nowadays, we also, you know, siting is one of the things, what other technical issues do you see related to the nuclear reactors? Um, well, if, if you go to the, if it's, if it's associated with the nuclear reactor, uh, one might think about some of the challenges associated with with uh, load following and ramping up and ramping down and, and the impacts on materials. That, that would be an example associated with the reactor. And that again is, is a rich area for, for Jim's folks. Uh, I, I think, you know, some, some other challenges down the road might be associated with how, how you actually do the fueling. So I had mentioned that um, both of these concepts, these advanced reactors uh, advertise that they would do online fueling and so you'd have to think about the configuration and actually how you do that and i know there's been a lot of thought about that but i haven't seen all the detail um, associated with with how the reactor the integrates with the grid and so forth well i think that's a real opportunity and again i think you can think about that at, at multiple scales uh, just e even in our own backyard, how are you integrating that with the wind and hydro? But even further afield, nationally, internationally, if you have micro reactors and smaller reactors, how do you site those out in remote environments, which is some of the opportunity 
uh, whether it's just for electricity or electricity and heat or for desalination. Uh, and, and again, the footprint is lessened tremendously associated with those reactors. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a lot of opportunity. And, and I think the other thing is, is just transportation mobilization of, of those reactors and the fuel. Yeah, so Jim, I'm going to ask you a question, and Mike, if you want to stop sharing and we can do kind of a, a panel with, with the two of you um, as we get other questions coming in. Um, so, um, so um, Jim, where do you, uh, I know you've learned more about AGI through AGI Day. Uh, where do you uh, see the first two opportunities that we might, one or two opportunities related to AGI and also ESIC um, related to the nuclear area. So just based on what you what you've learned, uh, you talked about that cool paper where you know it really one plus one was greater than two. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you know looking at AGI and you know it's it's heavily um, uh, modeling based, right? What what you're doing. And so I'm, I'm thinking that the the natural area for you know initial interaction is going to be through modeling, probably data analytics, and um, you know the the expertise that both institutes are developing in those areas. I think can probably be used to cross fertilize one another. Um, it's it's harder to see the the connection when you're talking about super fundamental materials science or, or chemistry or whatever but as the integration gets greater and as you start looking toward the applications like what mike was talking about uh, then you can see where that that modeling expertise from different uh areas could probably i think could could make a big difference and, and could could really be a place where where there could be interactions you know, the, the important thing always is never to force it <laughs> because <laughs> that never works. So those kinds of collaborations don't work, but it's also important to keep the interactions and keep talking because you never know what you're going to find that's going to be useful. I think, um, yeah, OK, I won't, I won't say any more about that. Okay. I did want to make a comment about the this concept of the energy island with the and the safety of the nuclear uh, reactor is effectively what they're doing is they're decoupling you know they're shipping the energy across the fence and so over on the other side of the fence you can use it for whatever you want and so you don't have to worry about all the safety you know we're taking advantage of having stuff in the reactor building so we can do experiments you can't do anywhere else they're taking advantage of putting the energy outside and doing stuff you can't do anywhere else. And so, you know, for example, the, the hydrogen, I think, is a huge opportunity because in the past, well, as always, any kind of petroleum refining, a refinery is really based on heat and hydrogen and, and how it operates. That's the fundamental coinage, as it were, for, for a refinery. Well, that comes from methane. Hydrogen comes from natural gas now. If it comes from nuclear power, all of a sudden the refinery can be anywhere. And and this integrates with the Bioproducts Institute. Well, and Mike Walcott can talk all about that too. But but the, the source of hydrogen is really important. Yeah, I think those are great points. So um, here's another question. I think it's for you, Mike. Um, Will any of the of these reactors be able to replace hydropower if the Lower Snake uh, River dams are removed and follow load, wind, and solar power? Load, follow wind and solar power. <laughs> well, that's that's an interesting discussion. Um, yeah, probably longer than the the next but, five but, minutes that but, we have. But, but the, theoretically, uh, yes. Uh, whether that will ever come to pass, though. That's, that's a whole other story, but yes. And and again, just to, to remind folks, with Washington State, they do have a clean energy um, goal of zero uh, CO2 emissions by 2045, and so nuclear can, can contribute to that story in addition to the other renewables. 
And Jeff has a question about other than the energy storage aspects, how would the natrium concept, how is the natrium concept different from the fast flux test facility that has previously operated on the Hanford site? Who is that to? I don't know who would be better for that one. Jeff, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, just when you introduced the concept and Mike, I think it was during your talk, um, you talked about the uh, the fast flux demonstration project that the, um, you know, that they called natrium, right? And so I'm just curious, it sounded like that was a sodium cooled reactor. It is. Yeah, and so I was just curious if that was uh, different fundamentally uh, than the FFTF. I, I think there are similarities, Jeff, but I can't tell you the specifics. But yes, I think they do claim that there, there's some uh, similarities for sure. OK, I was and just curious actually, what the... Actually, you know, if you if you go into the PNNL website, of course, they have deep, deep capability associated with FFTF, and which they now apply to uh, developing their position associated with molten salt reactors in general for, for DOE. So they claim a lot of expertise based on that FFT F example. Okay, great, thanks. I, I think part of the biggest examples, Jeff, is the ability to do heat integration with the sodium cooled reactors. Um, <clears throat> so when you talk about, you know, some of what Jim, I'm sorry, this is Mike Wolke. <laughs> if you don't watch it, it's my voice already. But um, um, when Jim was talking about sort of integration into um, other sort of processes like biofuels and stuff like that. Part of that is heat integration and the sodium cool reactors sort of facilitate that quite a bit. So the actual configuration of the reactor can change, but you still have a fair bit of uh, heat that can be used for process. So. All right, are there any, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Does anyone want to unmute and ask a question of our two panelists? Okay, well, we're gonna actually finish on time. So um, thanks to Jim and Mike for uh, sharing a little bit. I think, uh, you know, as we are in the, the advanced grid space, we think a lot of, uh, of the electrical side and it's good to see the connections in other related projects and um, and and how nuclear is changing to a different style and what we've seen in the past of the large base load and and some of those kind of things and and how it can be part of the grid as and the solutions of the future um, with or without uh, you know and adding to that that uh, capability so um, so thanks to Anurag for um, for uh, helping us with the AGI uh, ESIC webinar. And also, again, I want to thank uh, Darlene Miller and um, Linda Howe for their help in getting this going. And if you have uh, questions uh, for either of our speakers, uh, we can uh, they can put their emails in the in the chat, and uh, and that way uh, you've got that information. But uh, thanks to everyone for coming out today and have a great Tuesday and go kooks. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. You can also contact me and I can get in contact with it.